Hi everyone, I'm Arthur and I'm a partner at Privatam. A few words on us, for those of you who do not know us, Privatam was formed in 2014 with the mission of democratizing the access to customized investment products to wealth managers all over the world. And we do that with an emphasis on our unique blend of human and technological expertise. As head of content at Privatam, I'm very glad to welcome you to our first installment of the series called Decoding the Future of Finance, which will allow us to look with a bit more depth into some of the hottest trends in the financial world. These are trends that we often hear a lot about, but don't have the full understanding. As we have also recently launched a partnership with Seba Bank, which will allow Privatam's clients to gain access to investments linked to cryptocurrencies. And given the buzz around cryptocurrencies in general, there is no better moment to talk about this topic than now. And for this, I have invited a very special guest, Yves Longchamp, who is head of research at Seba Bank. And uh, we'll be having a, an interview uh, where we'll be asking some of the most common questions about this topic. Some of these questions have been provided to us by our clients. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, Eve, welcome. Thank you for being here. Tell us a bit more about yourself and Seba. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, Arthur. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for, for having me. Um, so Seba is actually a bank, and uh, this is a Swiss bank. We got the Swiss banking license in 2019, and we have a, one specialty. This is to be a focus on um, cryptocurrency and digital assets, which makes us obviously different from all other uh, Swiss banks. Actually, we have uh, four different business lines. The first one is trading and credits. So you can trade crypto versus fiat currency, but you can also get credits in fiat currency when you pledge uh, cryptocurrency. The second uh, business line is uh, client and investment solution. So it's all about asset management, creating investment product and research, which is uh, what I'm heading. And we have a third business line, and this is asset tokenization. So this is about uh, making digital real assets. You can tokenize uh, more or less whatever you want. This is the idea. And these three lines of argument are based on the fundamental layers. And these layers is custody storage. Because when you own a cryptocurrency, I'm sure that Arthur, you will ask me a question on that. Actually, what you own is not really the assets. But the private key, the private key is your, is your password, and this is what you store. And this is important to have it because if I, if someone have uh, this uh, private key, then actually he's the bearer of your assets. So the, the key part is to be able to store um, uh, this um, this uh, private key. So this is about business line. Actually, we, we are open in different countries and uh, we are different clients that goes from uh, banks to family office, hedge funds, or, uh, you know, big private individuals. Well, it depends. We are kind of open to a lot of different uh, types of people in request. Very interesting. Thank you, Eve. And yes, uh, hopefully we'll be able to tackle a bit more the subject of, of the private keys. Uh, so without further ado, I would jump into the, the first question. Uh, we often hear a lot about blockchain. Every time we hear about cryptocurrencies, we hear it many times in conjunction with the term blockchain. So perhaps if you, if you could start off by hearing from you what a blockchain is. The way I see that is a blockchain is a book and then each block is like a page. And in each page, you have uh, sentences and words, obviously, which are transaction. Just keep in mind that the blockchain is a big database. Uh, this is also a data ledger technology, DLT. And the ledger thinks about accounting. This is why we talk about transactions. So you can imagine that on each page or on each block, you have a few uh, transactions. And this is what uh, what is a block what is a blockchain, and what happens in you know you you fill uh, the transaction page after page, and when the page is down, you know you you just add it at the bottom of the other one, and you start a new page, but you want to keep them uh, ordered because it's important that for example if you have page let's say forty two. 42 was written after page 41, after stage 40. So if there is a transaction, you still keep the orders so that you cannot double spend everything. And you need to order that. And to order that, you have a certain cryptographic glue. This is called the, the hash that allow to order stuff and to not be able to just reorder the pages. 
And this is how a blockchain is organized. And one of the key elements of a blockchain in the world of public blockchain, uh, which is called also permissionless blockchain, this is that they are decentralized. And decentralized is a key uh, event. Again, we can go back to the idea of uh, books. You know, if you take a, a books, uh, a well-known books, you will find it in many places in the world, because there are many exemplars of the book, you will find it in, in many different libraries. And uh, uh, so to say, they are decentralized because you have in one, exam, one, one exemplar of each book in many libraries. This is decentralization. And blockchain is decentralized, meaning that this big blockchain is, you have a copy of the blockchain in different places. And if uh, and, and, you know, if I want to change one page, everyone else will say, yeah, it's not exactly the same book. So it's why it's important to be decentralized. This is about, this is about security. So blockchain is like a book. So to say in each block is a page and each transaction is a sentence. This is how you make uh, the story goes. I like it very much how you have explained it and it makes a lot more sense to me now. Thank you. So what is the connection between blockchain and cryptocurrencies? I mean, in the world of permissionless blockchain, we see the blockchain public where everyone can participate freely. You need to incentivize people that freely give their time to make a good job. And for them to, to be sure they make a good job, you need to reward them or to punish them if they do a bad job. So it means that in a public blockchain, you need to have a, a cryptocurrency. It's like the, the flip side of the same coin. You cannot have a, a public blockchain without cryptocurrency or the other way around. So if we take the case of Bitcoin, you know, for example, you are two, you are one of the miners, which means actually you are the one who writes sentences in a book and you will check whether all the, the you also edit the book. You will see whether the, the book is written, there is no mistake, everything is fine. And obviously you do a good job and you are quick. You are the first one to propose the page, which is correct. Then uh, you will receive a reward in the form of Bitcoin for the Bitcoin chain. So each time there is a new page added, each time there is a new block added, you receive now 6.25 Bitcoin plus some fees. Uh, which are based on the transaction fees and so on for the for the job you you did, and this is how it works. So it means actually when you do a good job for the blockchain, it's good for you because you get rewarded and Bitcoin has value, so you're happy. You can have a good earning with us, and the beauty of that is what you do for you, which is very selfish. You do also for the common good because the common good is to have a, a good blockchain, a blockchain which is safe a blockchain that really tell the truth. So what you do for you is good for the common good. And when the common good increase, then the value of the Bitcoin increase. When the value of the Bitcoin increase, then your reward increase and create a kind of a virtual effect, uh, which is good. And this is why cryptocurrency is key, first of all, for the security and for the functioning of a blockchain. Thank you, Yves. So you've already um, defined a cryptocurrency as something integral to a blockchain. Have you, yes. You've already mentioned uh, Bitcoin, which is by far the, the most known and popular cryptocurrency. Um, what is it exactly? What is a Bitcoin and who controls it? So Bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency to have been created. It was created in 2009. We don't know exactly who did that. Someone say uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, but we don't know if this is one person, a group, or we have no idea, but this is there and, and it works. Um, and actually how it works is you need to have a wallet. It's like when you... You know, most of the time now when you don't need cash, I mean, physical cash, usually you, you do a transfer, you transfer money from one account to the others. And actually you, you can see also the parallel here. You need an IBAN, which is your account key. You need a public key. The public key is actually what people know. Your IBAN, you can, you can tell it to everyone you want. You don't risk anything. What you don't want to uh, give is your password. What you don't want to give in the blockchain technology is your private key. And with the private key, you, you access to your account. And with this account, you can transfer on the blockchains uh, different types of cryptocurrency to other wallets. This is how, this is how it works. Actually, it's a, you know, there is a, a very uh, close parallel between the technology we are used uh, to use and, uh, and, uh, um, and, and the blockchain. Obviously, behind... It's different, it works differently, but the ID at the high level is, is pretty much the same. 
Uh, another very hot question that you must hear all the time is, is it safe? And perhaps in connection to this question, whether it's safe from an infrastructure point of view, are we in a bubble territory? Has Bitcoin risen too much? Yeah, <laughs> this is uh, obviously a, a key question now. I mean, it's safe, yes and no. I mean, it depends the, the way you, you want to receive it. Let's say with the, with the negative answer, is it safe? I mean, probably not if you, if you look at volatility. Volatility of Bitcoin is extremely high. And, uh, you know, we, we have seen since the beginning of the year, it's been, it's been, you know, it was below 30, went to 42,000, went back up and down again. So this is a lot of volatility. So view that way, this is definitely not a safe asset. That's right. I mean, there are different ways to uh, see it as a safe asset. You know, gold is also something that is said to be safe, but it's also volatile. Obviously, volatility of Bitcoin and volatility of gold is not the same, but see, there is some volatility. So to be safe doesn't mean to have no volatility, no volatility at all. And then you can make the case for uh, Bitcoin being safe in the sense that it doesn't belong to anyone like gold. If you have it, you have it. No one can manipulate it. And uh, then it's safe. And, and then at the on the infrastructure side, this is also extremely safe. And here, just before answering this question, Bitcoin has a, and all cryptocurrency have a pretty bad reputation of being hacked and uh, you know, you, you lose your money. Yes, it happens, but it never happened on the blockchain or they, or to some blockchain, to they, some uh, small blockchain, it happens, but it's very difficult to attack a blockchain directly. Most of the time, this is an exchange which is hacked. It means actually, you know, you have your coins on the, it's not completely true, but let's say you have your coin on the chain, this is safe. And if you want to, to buy or sell for, for fiat, let's say US dollar or whatsoever, you need to, somehow take your, it's not completely true, but this idea, you have to take your coin out of your wallet to put it somewhere in the exchange, make the deal and then go back. And in between you have the weak link. So the exchanges are kind of the weak link. This is why it's important to, you go on the exchange, you make your trade and then you bring back your uh, cryptocurrency into your cold wallet, which is something outside the, the digital the digital space. And then you have something which is safe. And typically Bitcoin has never been attacked, has always been, or maybe it has been attacked, but we, we haven't seen anything. It has been extremely strong. And especially because the value of Bitcoin is high. So if you want to attack the blockchain infrastructure, you need to, um, to have at least 51% of all the technology to mine. And this is so much money that actually probably no one is able to acquire it. And even if you do that, why would you spend so much money to buy something that would have lost value when everyone realized actually that uh, it has been hacked? So it's, it's kind of, in, in, you know, nothing is impossible, but the likelihood is very, 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 very low. Eve, what, what are the differences you would draw between a Bitcoin and the traditional fiat currencies? Bitcoin and, and traditional currency, I think they, they are different in the sense that fiat currencies uh, are the currency we, we used to have or central in the sense that they are issued by central banks, where for blockchain, they are decentralized. So I think this is already the, the first uh, differences. Uh, the, one of the, the key differences is that this is the notion which is called in, in economics, elasticity of money. Bitcoin is not elastic at all. It's like gold. It's like any commodity. You have a certain amount of gold. You have a certain amount of Bitcoin. You cannot create more or less. You have just this kind of amount. And if you lose one kilo of gold, it's lost forever, except if, if someone else uh, find it. In the world of fiat currency, this is different. We see that uh, money is elastic. Uh, quantitative easing is, is, makes, makes money, you know, the, the, the size of the money supply to increase. This is the key difference. So one is uh, kind of given. This is the case for Bitcoin. You have other uh, cryptocurrency which are more elastic supply. It also exists, but this is the case for, for Bitcoin. And for fiat currency, you have an inflationary system when you create even, even more money. And actually, because I'm an economist, I, I think it's quite interesting to see these questions coming because we are back to uh, the roots of uh, what is money. 
And fundamentally, you have two uh, history of money or two, let's say, two ways to create money. Either people say money is a commodity or money, and this is what is called metallism. So it's based on something that has intrinsic value, or this is uh, something which is called chattelism. So as a king or as a government, I say, you have to use this money because this is a legal tender. And obviously, fiat currency is not linked to commodity anymore because the gold standard is down. Uh, this is uh, all about legal tender. You are forced to accept it and because everyone accepts it and you have to pay taxes with it. It has value. You want to have it. For Bitcoin, it's different. It's more like a commodity. It's difficult to argue whether it has an intrinsic value or not, but it has something which is uh, you, you are free to accept or not. It's like gold. You know, no one will. It's always accepted just because people believe in, in gold and maybe we observe the same kind of things in, uh, in, in, uh, in Bitcoin. It's quite interesting to see that this uh, big story of uh, chartalism versus metallism is coming back with, with Bitcoin now. Um, you've already touched on it at the beginning, but if we could uh, look at it with a bit more detail. So uh, run us through how a Bitcoin in is created. In other words, how it's mined. Yes. Yeah, actually, the, the process of mining is, uh, is a very nice word to say that the, the, the miners are actually, um, you know, computers that are checking whether a page of a block is correctly written, so there is no mistakes uh, in it. It means that they check every transaction, so it means that, for example, if I want to send you one Bitcoin, so first the miner need to check that I have an account, a wallet, and he has to check that you have a wallet, and he has to check that I have one Bitcoin at least to, to transfer to it. So this is part of the, the things, and you need to write it in a certain way. Like when you want to transfer money, you need to, to follow, so, you know, the SWIFT that allows you with a special grammar to tell you how you want to do it. So this is the first things. And when this is done, when everything is fine, so the page is kind of edited and ready to be published, there is one little trick to be done. And this is, uh, this is uh, hashing. It means that actually it takes all the information in uh, this page and need to solve a, a problem. And to explain you what the miner has to do, I will take another example. Imagine that uh, you have a puzzle with thousand pieces and uh, you just received 999. So there's just one missing. And what I ask you to do is not to make uh, the full puzzle, but actually just to, uh, to show me the missing pieces. Actually, the only way to, for you to come with the design of the missing pieces is to make the puzzle, right? And actually this is what it works, this is how it works. And this is why Bitcoin uh, uh, consensus is called proof of work because you need to work, you need to do something. And there is not many ways to do a puzzle, just brute force. And so the, the, the difficulty increase, so the more people try to solve this puzzle, uh, the faster it will take, but because Bitcoin is made so that you have a block or a page written every 10 minutes, you increase the size of the puzzle. So it starts with, let's say, 1,000 pieces, then you went to 10,000, 100,000, 1 billion pieces, and so on. And you still need to find the, the missing piece. And the missing piece is the hash. And when you have the hash, then you, you show the hash, you broadcast the hash to everyone, say, look, I found, the, I found the missing PC, this is the correct one. And everyone say, oh yes, you're correct. Because you know, it's very easy to check if a puzzle is made. You know, when you see the puzzle, you say, yeah, it's correct or not. But actually it takes a long time to do. So you have this asymmetry, easy to check, but painful to do. And this is exactly how the whole process of uh, proof of work is done. And uh, because of this energy and this, um, you know, all this energy spent, you are rewarded in terms of Bitcoin and you show that you invested time. If I am now convinced about Bitcoin and I want to invest in it, how should I go about it? Uh, and another question is, uh, one Bitcoin is now worth $35,000. Can I invest less than that? In other words, can I hold a fraction of a Bitcoin? Yes, I mean, 
first on, on first question where you can buy where you can buy it you can buy it on exchanges as i mentioned there are many uh, exchanges online or you can also go directly to seva because we have a trading desk uh, to do that so it's it's very easy to buy you can also buy on products uh, they are uh, ETF, uh, they are also, we, we have, for example, certificate on that, that allows you to buy it uh, with an IBAN in the traditional space. But the thing is, the, the second thing is, it's not a big deal that uh, uh, Bitcoin is, is worth 35,000 or 40,000, because you have also cents, like in US dollar, you have cents, in uh, Bitcoin, you have Satoshi, and uh, Satoshi is a, a 100 million of uh, a Bitcoin. So it means that uh, as long as uh, uh, a Bitcoin is not worth 100 millions, it means that one Satoshi will not cost you more than $1. So there is still way, and this is completely fractional. So you can, you can try, you can, you can uh, buy, for example, I don't know, uh, whatever amount you want, it's completely fractional. So uh, you, can, you can buy really whatever you want, a half, a third or, or pi, Pi Bitcoin, if you want, you're completely free to do that. There is a lot of noise around cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin in specific about its legal framework. So where are we now in terms of its legal acceptance by the different governments? Yeah, that's, uh, I think it's still a gray zone. It depends a lot of the country where you are. In Switzerland, where, where I am, uh, the situation is quite good. We are the crypto nations. We, we are supported by the government. There will be a law, DLT law, that will be implemented, if my, if my memory is correct, on the, on the 2nd of February this year, which kind of make it legal and uh, really increase the, the legal certainty and uh, I think that, that's really a good deal. It's, this is not the same for all countries. And, um, you know, there's some countries have done it. Some countries are more open to it. We see also central banks having kind of a different position. Obviously, they don't really want to push for that, which makes a lot of sense. They are not completely against because they like the technology. I think it's still a gray zone. My takeaway from that is, Bitcoin is here to stay because this is a technology that works and the proof of concept is, is, is done. So it works for more than 10, 10 years. We see institutional investors coming. We see also more regulation, which means that we see that uh, exchanges which are unregulated are under pressure to be regulated to have uh, uh, better KYC ML, know your clients and the asset anti-money laundering process. And I think this idea is, you know, if you cannot really fight against something, the best way is to, to make it, you know, um, integrate into the legal framework. And given that Bitcoin is here to stay, I think that, you know, government will come with, um, it will take time, obviously, but I think that government will come with regulations that are at the end of the day, friendly to, uh, to Bitcoin holders and to other cryptocurrency holders. And in terms of acceptability, uh, what trends have you been seeing? Yeah, acceptability is definitely increasing. I mean, 20, 2020 was a, was a great year on that respect. We have seen many big names, big investors entering the markets. Uh, you know, a lot of hedge funds legends uh, entering the market, even Ray Dalio, which is someone I, I personally extremely appreciate, who was, who was always very skeptical, saying, you know, maybe I need to change my mind. I'm not sure he has invested in it, but uh, he's changing his mind. We see also Citibank, JP Morgan, just publishing forecast on, uh, on, uh, on Bitcoin, saying that I won't say this is mainstream, right? But I mean, you know, people are talking, people are talking about that. The Financial Times, for example, uh, uh, wrote about the, the biggest um, bubble when the Bitcoin was at $134, $134, so it was some times ago. And now at the beginning of this year, they, 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 on their front page, they say, you know, Bitcoin is integrated. And, and we see also a, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, investment product coming more sec more more regulated, we are a regulated bank, for example. So, I mean, we see adoptions and we see also, this is something we realize uh, when we look at our clients, 
clients are coming and want to have that in their portfolio to not obviously you know you, you start small because you don't want to, to have all all in bitcoin but you want to try to have that because it improve uh, the potential it improves the diversification so adoption is definitely there so we we see that ev everywhere we see the, the data the number of wallets grayscale uh, has increased uh, on 60,000 bitcoin now uh, to, to create products. So, you know, it's, we see that everyone is coming. There's a lot of adoption for, for both institutional and uh, retail, uh, retail investors. It's, it's very fascinating to see how it's uh, growing up very quickly. You have spoken about central banks and CBDCs. Can yes. you tell us a bit more about what they are and whether they are a threat or a good thing for Bitcoins and cryptocurrencies in general? Yes, I, I mean, CBDC uh, is for central bank digital currency. This is nothing else that a digital, that a central bank currency, a digital currency which is running on blockchain. And I think there is a good news first because if central bank do that, it means that the technology is good because central banks are not known to are to be risk taker and to jump on the first technology that exists. So I think it's. Uh, it shows that blockchain per se is a good technology. And second, CBDC are not uh, in direct competition to Bitcoin because you, know, you, you don't have Bitcoin in your portfolio or any other crypto assets in the same way and you have your own uh, currency, whether this is US dollar, Swiss franc or Argentina peso, this is not for the same use. So I think this is, this is something completely, completely different. But in my view, it shows that there is a need, there is an integration to do that. And in my view, it also means that if you are central banks and you are responsible for financial stability, you need to be able to help uh, your banking system, if there is an issue, we all remember what happens, uh, you know, almost uh, 15 years ago uh, when Lehman Brothers broke. The good news, it happened during the weekend, but the issue with cryptocurrency, this is 24 7 and uh, so it works all the time. And I mean, you need also to have central banks that are able to inject liquidity in the financial systems during the weekends. And one way to do that would be blockchain. So, in my view, one way central bank are interested in, uh, in, in blockchain is not that they really want to push it, but when you observe, a f you know, when you see a fact, you change your mind. And when you see the success of Bitcoin and so on, you have to find a way to support your system, given that each financial system are unstable per definition, and there will be obviously crisis in the coming years linked to Bitcoin or not, I don't know that, but there will be needs probably to uh, to inject new liquidity as well to support the financial system and blockchain working 24 seven would be a nice way to do that. So I think this is probably one way to, to answer this question. Thank you. Some critics will draw a parallel between Bitcoins and the old bearer assets. So okay. bearer bonds and bearer shares, which is an asset that will belong to whoever physically has it at any given time. In other words, it is not registered and hence it is not controlled. Um, and it's, uh, it was used before it was pretty much banned by other governments as a way to facilitate uh, asset evasion and money laundering. How would you respond to this criticism? Yeah, this is a critics we, we hear a lot. Um, I agree. I mean, Yes, certainly some Bitcoin or every other currency are used for, for criminal reasons, you know, as, as anything else. If you take a Swiss bank notes, for example, you will find a trace of drugs on it. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm a dealer for that. But there are different ways uh, to look at that. First of all, and I think this is the key difference with cash. Uh, I mean, cash, when I mean really physical cash, it's this is traceability. With, when I've got a, you know, bank notes in my pocket, who knows where it comes from? I have no ideas. Uh, with blockchain it's different because on the blockchain the whole ledger is written so i can if i give you one block one bitcoin now you you, you will see that it comes from one one my wallet you will see where i bought it and until uh, it's really 
day creation on the, on the mining day. So actually, you, you can you can recreate a history of of um, of your own currency, and there is database in the US that look at all the hacks, for example, or all criminal activity that may be linked to Bitcoin, and you can use algorithm that correlates your Bitcoin or your cryptocurrency with uh, this uh, uh, specific event. And doing that, actually, I mean, there is a way to, to track that. So I think it should, it should limit that. And, and again, you know, maybe you own Bitcoin that are linked to a hack that happened uh, five years ago. It can happen. But if, if it has been uh, transacted already 100 times, you know, your link to these criminal events is zero you didn't know that so i think you you can you can create a sort of a, a sort of like you so i think this is the so i think this is the the first element the second one is as i mentioned you have more and more um, kyc aml and regulated entity that's um, that in a way limit the use for that and if you want uh, in if you are a criminal i think you are probably better way to to do that than, than using bitcoin you can use privacy coin Privacy coin are payment token, where the focus is on privacy, meaning that it's impossible to uh, know who is at the origin of the payment. And obviously, with this one, you cannot do that. But this typically, as a regulated bank, we do not offer this kind of currency because here the risk is is high. And actually, I, I just come to my mind there was a study for an, I think it was from CoinShare or something like that. Um, saying that actually the, there is less than one percent of Bitcoin that have been used in criminal activity so far, so it doesn't mean to be to be uh, to be to be high actually. It's very interesting. So the very technology can and its traceability can make it a lot uh, safer from a legal perspective than the physical cash. Eve, it is said that one of the geniuses behind. The cryptocurrencies concept is that even if governments were to outlaw them, and of course they could, they would never be able to bring it down because to do so, they would have to bring down the whole internet, which obviously in today's world is not conceivable. Is this a correct understanding? I think that's correct. It's a correct statement. Actually, the, the way it works is this is, full, this is the beauty of decentralization. You know, when something is fully decentralized, and it's like I come back to the to to what I said at the beginning. You know, it's like when you have a book in each library of the world, and you burn half of the library, you still have books. This is uh, the pity of what happened to the to the Alexandria Library, actually. And so now that it's it's possible to have many blockchain, you know, in many nodes or many copies, and this is fully decentralized. Even though um, almost all of them um, are disappeared, actually, you still can recover the history of the ledger, and you can still access your 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 Bitcoin. So, in a way, if if you really wanted to put it down, ah, so probably you will have to put down the whole um, internet system, which is probably something that no one really wants to have. So, it's probably not po possible to to really prohibit, in my view. And this is obviously a, a huge, unique selling point for Bitcoin and for other currencies, definitely. What are the main differences between Bitcoins and uh, the other cryptocurrencies we often hear about? Yes, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, cryptocurrency. There are more than 8,000 of them. Bitcoin is by far the biggest. It takes, it's about two thirds of the whole market cap. And, uh, but there are also many classes of, uh, of currencies. So if, if you want to, you, you need to classify uh, the different uh, other currency. By the way, other currency, all currency which are not uh, uh, Bitcoin are called altcoin. And in the altcoin, you, you see many different types of coin. The first type is payment token. Bitcoin is a payment token. The only thing you can do is pay. But uh, then again, you have different types of token. For example, you know, uh, uh, even if in the real world, in the FX space, US dollar is different from uh, Argentina peso, and this is different from Swiss franc. We know that Argentina peso, if you live in Argentina, is good. This is more, may, probably not the place when you want to save money uh, for futures given inflation. US dollar would be fine because you have a lot of liquidity, but we know that it's going down, or you want to buy Swiss franc, which is a safe haven and which is always going up, this is very strong currency. So there are all payments, 
token, so to say, all banknotes, but they are very different. And to go back to crypto space, this is the same. You have Bitcoin, you have Bitcoin Cash, you have Bitcoin Satoshi value, uh, Vision, you have Litecoin, you have many of different uh, coins with all very dif different kind of uh, reputations, kind of history and different types of features. And depending on the features, you make your choice what you want. You know, the, the US dollar, the Swedish franc, and the Argentinian peso still remain because there is a need for all of them, not at the same time. And there is a need also to have uh, many different uh, cryptocurrency because there are many different means. And, you know, you want to use different, different cryptocurrency for different things. For example, you don't buy your coffee with gold, right? You buy it with, uh, with Swiss franc. You, you maybe don't want to buy a coffee with Bitcoin. You want to buy it with, uh, with something else. So this is really the, the, the first element. Then if we go out of the, the payment token, you see what is called platform token or utility token. And here you have the number two currency, Ether. And here, this is completely different. This is kind of the token. It's like, I should not use that because I think it has a bad connotation, but this is the only thing I have in mind. If you go to casino, you need to have a special token to play with that. And then you can you can do many things. Obviously, Ethereum is not casino. This is why it's not a good idea to do that, but I don't find any any anything else. So you need to have a special token to enter an ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, you can create smart contracts, which is something you cannot do on Bitcoin. And the smart contract is typically we do a transaction, we make a bet on the next football uh, football game. You you are for 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 team A, I am for team B. You uh, bet uh, I don't know one Bitcoin. It's maybe too much, but you are. I mean I don't know. Let's say you bet one Bitcoin. I bet also one Bitcoin. Uh, uh, team A win automatically the. The, the smart contract will observe that team A1 because this is available on the internet and will transfer directly to you uh, this, this one Bitcoin actually. And here you don't need any third party, you know, you just put it somewhere on the, on the blockchain and the blockchain do it. So this is platform, this is what it's doing. And then on the top of this platform, you have a lot of different services which are creating, for example, DeFi for decentralized finance, when you can borrow a lens, liquidity mining, you see also oracles, which are possibility to, to be sure that team A won and not that someone, you know, uh, created fake news. And so there are many uh, different possibilities. But the basic layers are definitely payment token like Bitcoin and, um, and the other one are, are platform token. But then the, the list is, is becoming bigger and bigger and more complex. And, and maybe a last point is among the 8,000 uh, different uh, cryptocurrencies, I mean, only a few of them will, will survive in the long run. And uh, you have to, if you want to invest in this small uh, currency, do your due diligence first because they are good and less good tokens as well. Very important to have in mind. Now, should we view cryptocurrencies as a separate asset class? Oh, yes, absolutely. We've published a few uh, um, articles on, on these topics. And uh, the answer is yes. And there is no doubt to that. And I will tell you why I think this is the case. In my view, I, de I, I define a, an asset class as, as a, a set of assets that share the same fundamental driver. For example, equities, whatever equity it is, if you want to value it, you need to have the risk free rate, you need to have the equity risk premium, and you need to have the cash flow. If you want to, uh, to, to understand what if a bond has good value or not, again, you need risk free rate, you need a credit risk, you need the maturity, and you need the coupon. So you see that equity are different from bonds because they have different uh, value drivers. And this is the same for, for cryptocurrency. For cryptocurrency, there are many different cryptocurrency, but it seems that there's sort of consensus that they all share the same value drivers. These value drivers are um, the network value, how many people use it. Obviously, if no one uses it, it has no value. This is why Bitcoin has a lot of value because you have a lot of users. This is also the monetary policy. So with Bitcoin, a special monetary policy, when you have maximum 21 millions, you will never be able to have more than that. So the money supply is inelastic. You have different types of, of supply, but still it matters. 
And, and finally, the, the, the third element is token economics. This is how uh, the token are distributed to the miners typically, or to the stakers. Stakers do the same job uh, miners, but using a different type of consensus. So we, if, you, if you get a good understanding of uh, the network, a good understanding of uh, the monetary policy and token economics, then you can kind of understand what will be uh, uh, the value. And then I didn't mention risk free rate, I didn't mention equity risk premium and so on. So it is per definition a different asset class. And we all know that adding a new asset class um, uh, have a, a lot of diversification potential. We just published a piece on, on diversification and we show that actually indeed adding Bitcoin obviously help a lot, even if you had a, a small amount. So if you, if you allocate a few percentage and if you add uh, some other currencies as well, so you have a diversified crypto portfolio in addition to your diversified traditional portfolio, the sharp ratio increase a lot. You can easily double it even if you add uh, you know, a few percentage, if you allocate only a few percentage of Bitcoin. So yes. This is another asset class, and yes, it has a lot of diversification. If we are to view cryptocurrencies as a different asset class with their own unique drivers, why was it that in March last year, it also crashed down when virtually all other asset classes uh, came down as well? Yeah, <laughs> that's a very good question. Thank you very much. I mean, I will ask your question, but I will say that first gold, which is uh, known to be the safest asset in the world, uh, did also perform also badly during the during the this the COVID crisis in in March. And I mean, this is informative about the the type of crisis we have. You fundamentally, in my view, you have two. You have many types of crisis, but the effect you see in the and on markets are, are either you have a flight to liquidity or flight to quality. And this one was definitely a flight to liquidity, which was the asset that did well, US dollar, because this is the liquidity provider of the world. And this was US treasury, because you know it's linked to the, to, to the US dollar and it provide liquidity. Um, gold didn't do that well because it's not that liquid. I think it, it offer, it offer uh, some kind of safety in terms of a safe asset. In my view, what you observe for Bitcoin is probably the same. It, it's still a small market, so you don't have the liquidity uh, you want to have. And at that time, there was certainly even less uh, institutional investor, much more retail investor with uh, high leverage as well. So, you know, leverage goes well until it doesn't go well, and then uh, it, it, uh, it hurts a lot. So probably you had also this effect. I mean, liquidity was missing and the price drops probably way too much. So this is, in my view, the, the, way, the way we have to, to see it. And for me, it doesn't really mean that it didn't um, fulfill its promise to, to be a safe asset. I think it's certainly um, a different uh, asset to play with different fundamental driver. So you think that we will see Bitcoin as a safe haven in the same manner as we look at gold at the moment? Yes, I think I think we'll probably go this way. I think we have to be very careful here what we define as safe assets. Again, I think safe asset is not something which has no volatility. In my view, safe asset is something which is different, which is outside, uh, really to come back to my um, economic uh, knowledge, uh, to, to my experience. It's, you know, you want to be safe. People want to have gold because they want to, to have something in case something happens. Some, if, if everything crash, you have still gold. So, so you will survive. We all have memories or, or grandparents told us that during the, the, the Second World War, it was good to have a piece of gold under the mattress. And I think that's and this is this is a safe asset because it has value per se. And the advantage of Bitcoin relative to, uh, to gold is that you can cut it in very small pieces in satoshis. Uh, it's very easy to carry because it doesn't weigh too much if you have to flee. And you can just take it with you wherever you want as long as the internet works, as long as you have a, a Wi-Fi. This is obviously an open question if you're in a, in a, in a, in a, in a difficult situation, uh, you should have access to it. So I think it has also a lot of advantage in this sense. 
and the specificity of Bitcoin and also the perception. This is what you see, what you read. You know, the person, how people uh, understand Bitcoin and see Bitcoin in relation to or in comparison to all other altcoins, it is, it is something different. Like gold is different from silver, right? You cannot really explain it, but, you know, give a, give a, give a, a ring, a gold ring to your wife or a silver ring to your wife. I think, you know, she will be she will uh, see different there is no clear reason to that so there is something i think we should stop sometime to be too rational and just accept what we observe and we have to accept that actually bitcoin is different than the others in the same way as gold is a, it's kind of a different metals in comparison to the others so it can be yes a, a sort of a, a safe asset i think you've already mentioned that uh, switzerland is about to approve uh, regulatory framework around cryptocurrencies, which is probably going to be a very important milestone uh, for them. Which other milestones should we look out for in 2021? Uh, and on the flip side, what challenges could we face for cryptocurrencies? Probably the, the big challenges will be still on the regulatory side, especially because there is a, a lot of uncertainty. So you never really know. What we expect for a long time is to see a first Bitcoin ETF in the US. It has always been kind of postponed. I think if, and you know, it, it should happen at some point in time, hopefully 2021, if this is the case, it means that, you know, it's kind of, a, it's mainstream. Everyone can invest in that and, and, and that will be, and I think that's, that's something which should, we should observe. And as usual, when the, the US does something, all the other countries follow the rules. So this is a, a big uh, thing that we follow carefully and we hope it will come. In terms of development on the blockchains, <clears throat> Bitcoin is fine, but you know, it's like gold. This is not the only metal which is shining. There are many, many different uh, coins which are, which are developing. There's a lot of uh, complexity in the ecosystem. And um, maybe to, 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 to finish on a, on a broader view, my view is that, you know, we started, let's say, 30 years ago with the Internet of Information, email, uh, media, and so on. And, and we still use it, and it's fine, right? And then we, we got Internet of Things. So we start to be able to, for, for example, with your iPhone or your car, you take position. It will t uh, tell you if there is a traffic jam or so on. Just give you some more information. That's fine. But all this information are available, are available to everyone. Internet of information is just to, to spread the information. What is missing is a technology or protocol that allows you to transfer kind of private information or something that has value. And something that has value must be transferred that if I send you an email, I still have it in my inbox. And so actually I duplicate it and you have it in your inbox. If I send you a cryptocurrency, when it's sent, it's sent. I don't have it anymore. It's done, like when I give you a banknote. And I think this technology allows for the internet of value, where you can have value which are, you know, financial values, like Bitcoin can be a security, it can be tokenized, but it can be also non-monetary value, your identity, for example, or your ownership rights or something. And I think you create something new. And usually when you have a broad ecosystem, uh, with more animals in it, you have more complexity, you have something which has more value. And I think that this time we have internet of information, internet of things, and internet of value together. And who knows where we will be in 10 years. I think it will create new services, new possibility we don't even imagine. And I think here, this is the future. Part of our future is definitely digital. Today, we cannot meet also because of COVID and we are already kind of digital. So I think that uh, we are going this direction and the internet of value and the blockchain technology as a protocol allows for this uh, next step. Thank you very much, Eve. It's definitely been a very enlightening conversation for myself for sure, and hopefully it will prove the same for our listeners. Thank you very much again for your presence and I hope we can catch up very soon again. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, pleasure. Thank you very much for being here. And I hope you found this interview as enlightening as I did. Stay tuned because additional videos covering not only cryptocurrencies, but other growing and fascinating trends in the world of finance will very soon come your way.
For those of you considering investing in cryptocurrencies, I would like to remind you that Parity contains the three products we have launched in partnership with Seva. There is a tracker certificate on Bitcoin. This will mirror the performance of Bitcoin. So allowing you to be invested in Bitcoin without leaving your current banking channel. So you can buy it from your existing investment account. There is a tracker certificate on Sebax, which is a index following other cryptocurrencies managed by Seba. And finally, a reverse convertible on Bitcoin, which will pay a nice guaranteed coupon and protect the invested capital, provided Bitcoin does not fall beyond a predetermined level. So log on to your parity, where you'll be able to find those three products plus additional supporting research. Finally, do not forget to follow us on LinkedIn. And until next time, bye-bye.